I'd like to talk to you today about possibilities and responsibilities. I'm sure that um, most of you are familiar with that poem by Robert Frost, The, the Road Less Traveled. And it says, um, in one of its parts, it says, uh, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and it has made all the difference. I think it's a great poem also because notice what he doesn't say. He didn't say, I made a difference. He said the road, had the, 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 his decision to take that road made the difference. And I'm sure one of the meanings is, or the implication, that it wasn't the easier road. It was probably a harder road. It was a bumpier road. There was no Burger King by the wayside. Yeah. And today, I want to make a case for you for that um, road less traveled. When I got the invite to talk here, I, I, one of my questions was, who would be sitting in the audience? And the answer was, there would be a lot of kids here. And I'm sure, th I'm sure there was no disrespect meant, uh, because colloquially, kids, you know, if you're 18 or even 20, you're still kids. But I think um, it bothered me because when you think about yourselves and when we think about you, it dilutes the perception of what you can do. So Mozart, when he was 16, he had written three operas and some 25 symphonies. Yeah, Einstein actually left school at 15 without any qualifications. And if you were a cave woman or a caveman today, you would be in middle age or you would be tiger food. So uh, when I was 18, I was in my gym uh, after a workout, and there were two men there, and they were talking about the then Czechoslovak communist government and whether it would reform. And um, I had read up a little bit about that subject, and I had a few opinions on that, and so at some point I just you know, broke into the conversation. I was telling them, that Politburo member, I don't think he's a real reformer, and so on. And I'm sure the two men were very amused by this 18-year-old kid breaking into that conversation and, and, and you know, giving his opinion. Turns out one of them was the bureau chief of Time magazine for Eastern Europe. And a few months later, we got to know each other a little bit, a few months later he invited me if I wanted to come help out in the office. This was the time before the internet, so I would pick up newspapers from the a store in the morning, I would clip some articles, I would keep his archives, and I was doing that for a few months while I was a student. And then a few months later, he uh, was on vacation, I think in the Caribbean, far away, and New York wanted a story about Poland. So he sends me a wire, and he says, why don't you go and report that? And then I went out and I reported, and that was my start as a, um, of my career as a very lowly reporter. Now, you know, I only did that for three or four years, and uh, then I went on to do other things, but imagine if I wouldn't have spoken up in that gym. 25 years later, it turns out I'm a CEO of a media company. <laughs> and I'm mentioning this to you not because I think you should already have written an opera or killed a tiger. I'm mentioning this because whether you're 18 or 38 or 58, you have the possibility and I think the responsibility to change the world. And I don't mean necessarily the big world, you know, the the global politics. Maybe it's just the world around you. But I think you have what it takes with what you have now and what you know how to do now. You can change the world. You can turn it into a better place. It really depends only on the path that you want to choose. And I'm going to tell you something that maybe you haven't heard recently because your, your parents or your teachers probably wouldn't tell you, but the fact of the matter is you are not special. We all are not special. We're actually all born equal. Now, we're not born with equal opportunities or equal chances, but we're all born equal. And I think that means for most of us in this room that we were born into health, into wealth, relative to most of the rest of the world. We were lucky, right? And there's nothing wrong with being lucky, but I think it does mean that we have a responsibility because we could choose just to coast on the lucky, right? We got better chances, we get to go to better schools. Chances are we'll have higher income for the rest of our life. We can just go and play golf. But I think there is more that we should demand of ourselves. It has something to do with working harder, with trying harder for others. 
If you think about it, we are all born with the capability to change the world around us. Yeah, I mean, very early on, nobody tells us that we can't walk and we just start walking at some point. And then we grow up and we continue to develop physically and cognitive abilities, right? And then at some point in life, at different ages, but at some point of life, many of us stagnate. We don't really change anymore. We kind of give up on, you know, we say we're, we're good where we are. The problem with that is, um, why do we do that? I think one reason is because we think, you know, the world is so complicated, you know, it's global warming, it's the f global financial crisis, I mean, what, what, what the hell can I do? I mean, it's so much harder than in the past. And I think we should think a little bit about history, because none of us had to live through the Second World War. None of us had to live through the First World War or the famines that followed, or the Spanish influenza that killed off 100 million people. And we can go back in history through the bubonic plagues, or if you're European, the last 1,500 years of basically fighting each other here in Europe. I don't think the challenges are any bigger than they are now. They may be more global. They may be a bit more complex because we're a global world and we're more people. But the challenges have always been there. And then the second reason I think why we stagnate is because we give up challenging ourselves, not because we don't do anything, or most of us are not lazy, but we get so absorbed in our daily life, in our to-do lists, in our tasks. And the problem with those to-do lists is they're all very necessary. And yes, you have to clean your room and do your homework and write the college applications and write the presentation for work. And we all have to do that. But we should not let that draw us out of really challenging ourselves. I mean, what's the next big thing we want to do with our lives? And that's true when you're 18, but frankly, it's true at any age. Most of you here in this room are going to play some role. You know, you're getting a great education. You're going to play some role in the field that you choose that's important. You're going to be a future leader. So I think you should set yourself some bigger challenges. And I'm going to outline a few challenges for you. The first one would be, be a better person than you were yesterday. And in order to be a better person than you were yesterday, I think you, we each have to learn something every day. And the best lessons that we can learn are not necessarily classroom, or it's not learning more facts about something, it's interacting with people, and having the chance to be reflect on what we do and who we are, right? And I'm afraid, and, I'm, and I, I know this is going to be really hard, you have to put your phone down. <laughs> and this is really hard, yeah, because you are a generation that was practically born with an iPhone in your hand, yeah, or with a Facebook profile. And you have your WhatsApp groups, and that's, that's great. I, I think social media are really important. I use Twitter a lot. I think social media will continue to play a bigger role in our societies. But social media have a big risk, which is the risk that you become very antisocial. Because the thing that you need to think about is the challenge is not to react to the endless stream that's coming through social media. You actually have to do yourself. You have to form your own opinion. Yeah. So please put your phone down. And then when you do that, then you step up, and then you dare to fail. <laughs> and again, that's really, really hard for many of you because you've all been wired from very early on to achieve. And you've gone to good schools, and you've done good exams, and I saw the list of colleges that you're going to outside. That's impressive. The danger with that is if you achieve early and you achieve a lot, is that you become really comfortable in that area where you achieve, and you continue to stay in that area because you get great feedback and people are proud of you, and they give you good feedback. But then you don't push yourself anymore, right? And then there's some business moguls who will tell you, failure is not an option. Yeah. That's untrue. <laughs> failure is always an option. Actually, in many things worth doing, failure is the most likely outcome. And you still have to go and do it. Abraham Lincoln, his fiance died. I think he went bankrupt twice. He lost eight elections. And then he went on to become the 16th and possibly the greatest president of the United States. Yeah, dare to fail. Because you have to fail to know. You have to hurt to grow. And if you think that things are falling apart, 
they may actually be just falling into place. The next challenge for you is explore your crazy thoughts. My three-year-old son is here today, and it's a great age because he keeps asking me why. Bye, Leon, I'm going to work. Why? <laughs> because I like work. Why? Because we write great articles. And then the other day, I have to go to work. Why? I have to go make money. Why? So we can eat. There is this hunger to know, right? And when he will grow up, and when he will grow a few years older, he will ask, why is there air? Or why can't I walk on the ceiling? Or why can't humans fly? And you ask all of these great questions, and then sometime, I suspect around third grade or fourth grade, he will stop expressing the crazy thoughts, the crazy questions. And I'm not sure why that is. I think it has something to do with peer pressure, you know, not to look stupid in front of your friends, you want to be cool, you know. Or the teachers tell you stop asking silly questions, or the parents, we ask him to stop asking silly questions. And much of that is necessary because as part of civilization, actually, we have to learn to function with other people and in a, in a society. Yeah, it's actually really hard to live with crazy people. <laughs> but the problem is, if you keep suppressing your crazy thoughts, if you keep suppressing the big thoughts, after a while, after a few years, you're going to become dull. And then you're going to develop a dull brain. And the dull brain is the biggest loss because it means you've lost your potential. You're not going to go anywhere anymore. So explore the crazy. When I was um, uh, in politics, I, I, I'm not a politician, right? I've always been interested in politics. Two years ago, a friend of mine, Matthias Strauss, and I, we met for a coffee. And he said, uh, you know, we were both saying, you know, politics is really bad in Austria. And we said, we're going to found a new political party. What? I mean, my wife asked, what? Politics is a dirty place. You don't want to do politics. Yeah. The problem about that, though, is politics is a necessary place. And politics is always there because politics is the place where we all decide how we're going to live together. And if we do it like the way we're doing it right now, that means half of this room here, you're not even going to bother going to the vote, to vote. And the other half here is going to go vote every four years. But they say, you two, you go run things and then you run them for the next five years and the next 10 years, what's going to happen? They're going to run out of ideas at some point. They have to. And some people, humans are humans, will become corrupt. The whole system will become stale. So politics is always there. It's a place where we agree how we live together, but you know what? We're taking no interest in it. 99% of us say, you guys run it, and you know what? You, I, I know you run it really badly, but you know, just keep running it. <laughs> and that doesn't work, right? So we founded a political party, and we went to people who thought might support us or give us money, and you know, they said, um, you have no famous people, no famous names, you have no money, you have no chance. No, I'm not going to support you. Anyway, we kept going. We found the first 40 people who really had the fire in the belly, and then you know, we kept growing. We got 5% in the vote in parliament in September. We made it into parliament. But when we set out two years ago, I said, that's not enough. We actually we want to grow bigger. We want to grow big enough that we're going to go into government, and then when you're in government and you can set the agenda, that's when you can change things. And now there were elections in Salzburg two weeks ago. We already got 12% of the vote. And then polling for the European elections, we're around 12% as well. So it can't be done. You can't do it. It can be different, but it's hard. And as the saying goes, you know, only those who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world will actually change the world. It's really true. And the fourth challenge to you is light your own fire. There's a great quote by Gates saying, um, education is not filling a pail, it's lighting a fire. And that's very true. And all of you in this room have had great education already. So your fire is lit. And it's your job to make sure it stays lit. Now, you may not know how you're going to contribute yet. And as Baz Luhrmann says, some of the most interesting 40-year-olds I know don't know yet how they're going to contribute but they know they have the fire. They have that feeling. So um, to become special, you actually have to contribute. That's your responsibility. And sometimes you feel your light is shining and you're on fire and things are going well. And then there will be other days when the light is really waning. Yeah, it's really small. It's, you feel like it's going to extinguish. You know what happens when, you, when a fire dies? Nothing. It's just dead. It's your job to keep it alive. Put some logs on that fire. Just keep it going. Yeah? And if you do that, 
those are the challenges that you have, then, then you can make a real difference, right? And it's not easy. I'm not saying anything is. And many people will tell you, you don't have the money, you don't have the famous name, you're too young, you're ignorant. Take that as a feedback. Go out, learn more about the subject. Structure yourself, become organized, do stuff. And then surround your, yourself with people who think that you can do, who will support you. Find mentors who believe in your intelligence and in your power. And then if you find those mentors, don't disappoint them. And if you do that, goal will never, you know, the goal is not for life to be perfect. Life will never be perfect. You're going to get curveballs all your life. But every day it can be better than the day before if you work on it. Yeah? And if, you, if you're good at this, then you know, one of you will contribute a study to cure cancer. One of you will help save you know, the, or reduce global warming. One of you will help us build a rocket to fly to Mars, whatever it is. Or you just set up a business and you create value and you create jobs for people. And that's good. And that's what you have to do. It'll be a better world and then you will be special. So understand your possibilities. Understand your responsibilities and make a difference. Thank you. <laughs>